Hey, LinkedIn, and welcome back to Business Unusual. This is a live show where we are talking about the changing nature of work. I am Susie Jackson. I'm a news editor at LinkedIn, coming to you live today to talk about startups and side hustles in the pandemic. But before we get to that main story, I want to take a quick look at some of the top stories trending on LinkedIn today, July 23rd. First up, younger workers in leisure and hospitality roles are facing tough choices about the nature of their work. The Wall Street Journal reports that only half of workers under age 25 have jobs that let them maintain social distance, compared with about two-thirds of co-workers over age 25. A lot of tough decisions there about personal safety for workers in a time of high unemployment. On LinkedIn, we are also seeing conversations bubble up about big companies looking to cut costs by shrinking their physical offices. According to a Reuters analysis of earnings calls, more than 25 big U.S. companies like Halliburton and State Street have announced plans to cut down office space. Physical space is often the second biggest expense after payroll. But LinkedIn member Connor Mazden makes a great point on the value of in-person work, saying that sales, R&D, et cetera, need a collaborative environment and they feed off one another, that working from home does not offer that environment or productivity level. For more stories like these, check out the LinkedIn news module to the right-hand side of your news feed on your desktop, or when you click into the search box in your mobile app, scroll down a little bit and you'll see those news stories and more there. Jumping off the story about companies shrinking office space, I want to bring up today's poll that's live on the LinkedIn news page. Demand for new homes is surging across the U.S., possibly mapping back to people looking to leave urban areas amidst the pandemic as physical location becomes less important for their work. And we want to hear from you. Are, are you or someone you know considering relocating during the pandemic? Tell us yes or no and tell us why in the comments. We're going to come back to the poll mid-show and look at the results toward the end of the program. And speaking of location, back to the main story today, we want to look at some of the opportunities attached to this time of increased remote work. Unemployment, uncertainty are high. For many, there are few places to turn for stable employment in their immediate area. If you do have work, it still might not feel reliable, or maybe you have a steady job that you don't love. So what are the, some of the things that you can do about that? Could you possibly start your own business? Could that be one answer? Could starting a side hustle be an answer if that feels a little bit more attainable, a little less committed than fully starting a complete new business? Talk to me in the comments, talk to each other. Have you ever considered launching something yourself? What would it be? Is it freeing or terrifying or perhaps something else to think about being your own boss, especially in such a challenging time? Tell me about it, talk to each other. We love seeing you all come together as a community to support one another. If you're hiring, if you're looking for work, just talk about it in the comments. We're gonna to get to as many of your thoughts, questions and comments as we can throughout the show today. My main guest today has a ton of great insights into these questions of remote work and side hustles. And she's also done a lot of work across the concept of access to opportunity. I'm really excited today to talk to her about how this COVID moment, this remote work moment, might create new paths for people where they might not have existed before. I wanna welcome Felicia Hatcher to the program. She is a social entrepreneur and the co-founder of Black Tech Week. Felicia, thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you, Susie, for having me on the show. It's so it's really great to have you. You have launched businesses of your own. You're the author of multiple books on entrepreneurship, on budgeting, on marketing. We're going to talk a lot about side hustles because I think the audience mm -hmm. will be really eager to hear about those. But I want to start quickly with your work in the startup community. We're talking on the, at the top of the show about COVID reshaping the ideas we're having about remote work, mm -hmm. about opportunities. And I know a lot of your work focuses on the concept of innovation deserts. I would love for you to explain that concept to our viewers and talk about if there's an opportunity to address that in this, this new time of remote work burgeoning. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think everyone starts a conversation talking about how crazy the times we are in right, right now. And so uh, innovation deserts, like if you're familiar with food deserts, right, people having to travel miles oftentimes in order to get access to fresh fruits and vegetables, where, where over the past few years, where cities were having like a concentrated effort on building out their innovation economies, their startup and tech ecosystems. Well, innovation deserts were happening, right? There's a disconnect from a lot of black and brown communities or um, a lot of um, communities that are lower on the socioeconomic like kind of scale that were completely disconnected from being financial beneficiaries um, of the innovation economy and everything that it provides. And so our organization deemed those about four years ago as innovation deserts. And so what that means is it doesn't mean that innovation doesn't happen in these cities, in these communities, because they do. They have a long history 
of kind of solving these problems out of necessity because of either a lack of um, government funding, a lack of infrastructure, and like all these kind of ways of solving the problems have, have sprouted out. But this kind of boom that we've seen with our economy, um, there was just this big financial disconnect. Either businesses and startups weren't starting there, financial resources like investment, uh, whether that's VC or angel, weren't also happening there. The um, startup founders and entrepreneurs weren't being valued and a lot of their ideas weren't just weren't even being looked at as possibly being global solutions. And so we always give the example of of like Uber, right? And Uber Pool. And like the, the same exact utility of Uber Pool, kind of a stranger piling into a vehicle to go from point A to point B or strangers. Um, that same kind of utility of that was also existed in the Overtown area of Miami uh, 30 years ago. It was called the Jitney Taxi. Strangers piling into a vehicle to code from point A to point B, solving a major transportation infrastructure issue that did not exist in that community. But if you look in other areas, Jamaica was called partner throughout uh, the content of Africa. It's been um, not partner. I'm sorry, uh, J the Judah taxi and in Haiti it's called tap tap and all these other areas in New York. They had the Jitney system as well. But these had never been kind of looked at as solving global problems in these communities, hence a disconnect from the innovation economy and the financial kind of backing of what those ideas could possibly mean. And so those ideas were laughed at and they weren't given the right respectable amount of funding or a the right kind of resources for them to be able to grow. So we've got, you you're terming them innovation deserts. You're saying this they're not productive innovation. They're just not being considered in the right ways. There's a lot of innovative ideas coming. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, we have uh, Valentina in the stream is asking, I'm thinking about starting my own business in digital to go full in. Is it a good time to do it? So, so you, you, you've got this area with all these ideas. We've got remote work. You don't have to be in a certain place to do a certain job anymore. Mm -hmm. Valentina wants to know, is this a good thing for me? Could this be a good thing for those areas as well? Yeah, it, it is, right? And so, I mean, the, I guess some of the silver lining of what is happening now, um, we're going through some really traumatic times. But then like the, the way that we did business before COVID is not the way that we could do business like post COVID. I think Questlove famously said that, right? But it's true. And so it also presents some opportunities. I think location has been the biggest thing that has kind of either stood in the way of people being able to fully play out in the innovation economy um, or it just location wise as well as those companies not either being housed in those in those neighborhoods or in close proximity. And so when you look at companies like um, you know Twitter saying that I believe they're going to go re remote permanently, that now changes who can apply for those opportunities, where you can work, and then also still be in your city. Those companies also can now have a, a different kind of virtual presence that they could hire more people with the locale of being in these different cities, um, still do things from satellite, but it just presents a really unique opportunity. And I think on the entrepreneurship side and the small business, it also right creates an opportunity. I think one of the things that got extremely legitimized in, in the, more than anything in the past four months is that now what we before when we valued like things physically being with us or people physically being in, in front of us, now this kind of virtual space and kind of virtual living rooms or classrooms or office spaces is much more valued than it had been in any before, right? Like if you are a consultant, you don't physically have to go to you know your client's office being able to deliver that on, on Zoom and so also be able to charge the, your same amount is something that I think was a hard, sometimes a hard conversation for people to have uh, pre COVID. COVID that we're now currently being able to have, right? Building solutions, launching companies, launching ideas. Um, most times when people felt like they needed to have a brick and mortar in order to be a legitimate company or provide a service, you don't have to do that anymore. It's actually not safe to do that right now. And so that also presents an opportunity. So I think the biggest thing, Susie, is like not overthinking it, uh, but really thinking about like, how can I solve a problem for someone? And if I was a solution driven communicator or a problem solver, prior to COVID, I can still be one now, right? Um, it's actually the problems a lot oftentimes have been exacerbated than they were pre-COVID because people need solutions right this minute. And so you have to think like, how can I solve a problem? We even think about some of the side hustles that did not exist we couldn't even fathom that people needed to make masks and can set this up in their homes yeah. four months ago. And now this is like a hot commodity, right? Yeah. We think of 
people providing solutions for spraying down restaurants and spraying down tables or, or providing like the plexiglass in every single storefront restaurant business, that is something that also did not exist. It does not require a huge investment in order to be able to jump in and solve problems for people in this moment. Yeah, and even that's progressed. We went from the homemade mask was like, bring a piece of cloth to your local seamstress and they'll make it for you to like, now we're through to people are, are having custom masks for their weddings or their branded events, et cetera. Like we did that pretty quickly. Um, I'm, yeah. I'm joining us now. I wanna welcome you to Business Unusual. We're having a conversation with Felicia Hatcher about startups and side hustles. I see a lot of you in the stream really eager to hear about the side hustles part of this conversation specifically. We've already mm -hmm. got, we've got Heidi from North Carolina. Hello. Jewel from Delaware. Scott says, I started my side hustle with my small wood shop. Kathleen mm -hmm. says she loves being her own boss and having her own business. Uh, Dowdas says that she's a digital marketer for restaurants. So it's a Tough time to be in that role. The work has probably dropped off a bit. You have to be more creative about it. Saying mm -hmm. that um, since COVID started, she's been marketing skincare, music, and dabbling with her own e-commerce. You have to be innovative. Um, yeah. We've got a lot of folks here who really want to know, what do you? What, what is your wisdom about yeah, this? Yeah. So I actually don't think digital marketing for restaurants has dropped off. I actually think the need is actually greater because a lot of the companies or food businesses, and I'm a partner in a food business, right? And so, um, whereas the some of the normal areas of like high traffic that they could market their businesses to, where whether it's uh, fairs or festivals, whether it's chamber events, those no longer exist, right? And so people are highly, highly um, kind of making buying decisions and food buying decisions with their with their fingers, right? They're they're looking on social media. They're leaning more towards the, um, you know, the food delivery platforms than ever before. But then one of the most interesting side hustles that I've also seen pick up is like people providing kind of like this last mile food delivery option for restaurants that are choosing not to be not use the, the major platforms. Right. And so them focusing more on increasing their SEO so that they can get more eyeballs um, using, you know, Facebook ads or Instagram ads um, or LinkedIn ads, like, you know, much, much more than they had been before. Those are things that a lot of people and a lot of businesses actually had to kind of accelerate their acquisition of knowledge around figuring that out. And a lot of people just don't have time. Like their zone of genius is being in the kitchen or being a culinary like genius. It's not digital marketing, but it's a required and necessary way of how they either have to do storytelling or be able to directly reach out to people. So I think I've seen that a lot, right? Like I have a lot, I'm in tech, so I have a lot of friends that are in that business and things have taken off for them more. I think what has happened is the conversation has to change because that wasn't always valued because there were other ways in which they could do this or other ways restaurants were able to, to be able to do that, that now this is solely the area in which they need to play and learn how to excel. And so seeing that in a bunch of different places and a different bunch of different ways, whether it's food businesses, whether that is um, concierge services, I think have also picked up because people don't want to leave their homes or they physically can't leave their homes. These have also presented some ways. Um, a young lady that that's in our network, she started a concierge side hustle. And so, you know, when COVID first happened in the first few weeks, you could not get like an Instacart like order within less than like three to five days. You're just like, what is this? I'm used to it being like two to three hours. And so she started a concierge side hustle where she charged people $40 and she would I think go to up to two stores for them and she would do their shopping and she was able to get it to them much faster than the three to five days that it took the big boys. So when you think about side hustles, I think oftentimes we people think about it's this little thing that I'm going to tinker with. And no, it's like you're solving a problem and you can compete against the big boys because it's not always about price. It can be about saving people time. It could be also be about convenience. There's a lot of things that you can compete on so that you can still win and be able to provide people a solution to their problem and then also be able to drastically monetize that as well. Yeah, I, I love the ingenuity there. That's like a side side hustle from your <laughs> You've got the last mile delivery services already, but you're saying they were all booked. So just like start your own. Right, you right. That or, or also think about the stores um, or places that they are not willing to go, right? They have mm -hmm. certain partnerships but hey, if you need something from like the local artisanal shop or you need an art kit, which is something that I needed for, for my daughter um, from one of the local kind of kid things like Uber Eats, Instacart, ship, like they weren't picking up from there. And so that became a huge opportunity for this person to say, hey, I will go where they're not going. And that became her competitive advantage. So I think asking yourself that, like looking at the big boys, 
looking at the industry of spaces that you want to go in and saying, what are they not doing? And does this give, does this give me a competitive advantage to compete against big boys in a way that they are either too big to take, you know, to, to think about, or they're not thinking about, or they're not servicing uh, these people well, and they need this thing right this minute. Yeah, Marie here in the stream is, is totally agreeing with you on the restaurant marketing side. She says she's been doing that very job for her sister's restaurant remotely and started mm -hmm. a delivery rotation for her. We also have Roland in the stream. Welcome Roland, thanks for joining us, saying that it's a little intimidating to get into a side hustle right now. Um, Felicia, I, we, we were talking before, I know that there's kind of three categories of people you're thinking about who might yeah. not realize they're perfect for a side hustle. Can you talk yeah. to us a little bit about how people can maybe rethink their own situations? Absolutely. So we started a side hustle academy when like COVID first hit. It's it's free. You can find it online. And we started it specifically because we wanted, you know, as government programs were coming in and people were having a difficult job, either, either kind of navigating that or funding was running out left and right. We wanted people to say, you know, I can put my own oxygen mask on financially and I can get creative, right? Whether it's getting creative with limited resources or that's getting creative with the skills that I have I have amassed over the years of being a career professional, or you like you've lost your job or you've been furloughed. There are so many different things, and so we looked at kind of three different people that we were creating this program for, right? And so one, it was it was the the person that had lost their job during COVID. They had been laid off. They had been furloughed, and we want to say, put your oxygen mask on, learn some skills, learn some new ways of being able to. Um, market yourself, get in front of a new audience, fully understand digital digital marketing, um, fully understand e-commerce, fully understand how to pivot your conversation to have more compassionate uh, transactions and those kind of conversations and how you start positioning and selling yourself and you're selling your, your offering. So that was one person. Uh, the other person was someone who had an idea that they had been sitting on for, for a while. They have a job, they may have a business, but now they have a little bit more time than they had not had in the past because they're working from home. And this now presents a great way for them to kind of test things out using technology or test things out because they have a little bit of free time. And then the other person that we were thinking about is actually like they have a good career, right? Their salary, their job is, is secure at this moment or their business is doing OK in this moment. But they want to be able to beef up their their savings just in case something does happen because things are just really unpredictable and changing a mile a minute. And so we looked at those three kind of profiles for people as we built this program and built this course. And then we identified 65 uh, different side hustle ideas, just kind of spark ideas, and even things that weren't existing. Right. And so you think about wedding planners and event planners now planning virtual events. Right. That is a thing right, right now. You think of taking advantage of um, Airbnb experiences. I've seen people that are teaching cooking classes, people that are teaching, you know, a lot of us are starved for like going outside, going and traveling to the other cities and people are doing virtual tours and like wine tastings. I've seen sommeliers. I've seen Olympiads that are doing motivational like training and workouts all on like um, Airbnb, like online experiences, which I think is just fantastic. But then also just kind of testing out your idea before you then fully launch this thing. We have some time right now to be able to do that where outside is still kind of pacing itself. Some areas are open back up. Guys, I'm in Miami and we're kind of like back at the epicenter, right? So we're staying home and buckled in. But I think there's so many things that um, or opportunities right now to be able to kind of test out your your idea and then be able to fully launch. You know, one of the things that I joke about is like, you have a lot of people that, you know, make food in their homes, right? We, we call them trap kitchens, right? It's a funny name for it, but, but they are now being more legitimized than they had been in the past because if you don't want to eat at the stuff that you constantly are seeing or you constantly visit to, this now presents an opportunity for you to be able to sell and monetize through social media. Consulting, I think, is a thing that a lot of us immediately think about, but there's platforms like Clarity.fm that allow you to set up your consulting kind of practice and people can charge for them by the minute. You can charge by the minute, I'm sorry, for people to actually be able to kind of pick your brain. So if you've ever been tired of people saying, pick your brain, and you're just like, no, I need to send you an invoice to do that. This is a way for you to be able to check, kind of check that out, try that out, and then move on to like a more, um, more, like more stable kind of foundational like consulting practice. Coaching and courses are also a big thing that I've seen um, some people do really good and have been really lucrative for them with their side hustles. 
This is great. Felicia, this is a lot of great information. I want to go back to our poll real quick to give you a second to turn off whatever that ding is, because I think there's someone who wants to hear from you, and I understand why, but we're going to see if they can be a little quiet for a minute. But coming back to our poll for the audience, we want to know, have you considered relocating amid the pandemic at all? Let us know in the comments. A is yes, B is no, or tell us a comment. What are you thinking about that situation? Um, I see a lot of great comments and questions in the stream already. Audrey, has a question. She wants to know what are creative ways that you can do marketing. I think you're, you, we can answer that kind of as we go. Um, Alicia has a question specifically, Felicia, saying, "What is a good side hustle for a stay-at-home mom?" Mm. Ooh, I think there's, I think there's quite a few, right? And so I think one of the things that um, I know we're grappling with here in South Florida is, you know, some of the local counties have opened school back up, some of them have not, and so schools are needing a lot of support. Um, parents are also needing a lot of support. And so if you are a stay at home mom who has figured this thing out of like how to kind of manage your home, um, manage kids, and then also be still be able to kind of like function work wise, there's a lesson in that that you can monetize that could be a PDF that could be a guide that could be a short course. Um, Teachable is a platform that I absolutely love that I think is very easy. Kajabi is another platform. I would also look at like, what are your skill sets? What is kind of like your zone of genius? I talk a lot about like zone of genius, right? Thinking through like this, what you offer to the world, what you can say I'm definitively really good at and then being able to monetize that. I think the another thing is if you're good with social media, a lot of people have communities and groups that they're always looking for someone to kind of do the management of that for them. And so can you manage the group, help with bringing members in, help kind of moderate the group, maybe create some content for them that is in the voice of the person or the company that owns that group. That is something that I think a lot of stay at home moms can do because it doesn't require you to physically be on the phone or be live where your kids can kind of run in and run out. I'm a mom of two. So I know what it's like, like my husband and I have been running a business, running our businesses from home and then also our kids like jumping in and out of Zooms. And so things that you can do that don't physically require you to be um, kind of having a conversation or where interruption can happen. I think just off the top, that's a really quick way to, to think about that. I think transcription services as well, right? And so like there's a lot of companies like Rev.com, you go, I think go on Fiverr, go on Upwork as well to look for opportunities of what you can be doing. But a lot of companies are looking for people to either create the captions or transcriptions for their podcast, the show notes for their podcast, transcribing it. That also presents an opportunity for a stay at home mom where you can work and like if your kids are running in and out, it doesn't make you seem any any less professional in what you're doing because it's not forward facing. That's great. There's a lot of great tips here, Felicia. I, I, I want to get to some of these other 65 um, ideas as well. I'm, I'm seeing Heidi in the stream saying that she has an amazing side hustle in the health and wellness industry. She says, despite that all that's going on in the world these past few months, we are, and she writes, four rocket ship emojis. So Heidi, really glad to hear that you're doing well with your side hustle in the last few months. Wow. Um, you know, Audrey, who said she has a side hustle as well after being laid off in 2008 with the mortgage bubble burst, she invested in herself, never got comfortable, and she's glad she did because her business now is recession-proof. Nice. Um, Dow does says one of the best things we can do regardless of our industry is simply to ask, what do you need? Mm -hmm. um, and we have, let's see, Helen is in the stream asking, what do you need? She's saying, what is the best way to market your side hustle to other businesses? Yeah, and so one of, one of I think the great greatest ways is actually kind of what we're doing, right? Create content around the work that you were doing or that the work that you plan to do around your side hustle. I think one of the greatest gifts that we can have is like going live. And so a lot of people are apprehensive to do it because it just feels weird. You, you, you know, you, you don't have like the engagement of if you're having a conversation with someone, but tapping into your social network and your community that you have and start having conversations. And so one of the things that you really wanna do is like in the content that you're creating, really talk about the why you're doing this. Your secret sauce is your how, right? But telling people the why, giving them some tips. A lot of times what we realize in, in marketing is like we have to kind of educate people as to how you can work with us or educate people to why this thing is important, right? When I ran a gourmet popsicle company for seven years, in the first few years, that's what I had to do. And I sh we struggled with it in the beginning. We were like, oh my God, like when people were used to paying $3 for a, a box of popsicles and we were charging from five to $7 for a box for one popsicle, right? And so we had to spend a lot of time kind of educating people on why this was important, why this was a better dessert option for them. And so using 
LinkedIn Lives, Instagram Lives, doing webinars, I think are a really valuable tool that also don't cost you anything in order to get in front of audiences and, and start marketing your, your service. The other part of it is have a direct ask. A lot of times we have the idea, we have everything ready to go, and then we kind of skirt around this thing and hope that people come to us and then we can tell them about the service. Show up and show out. Closed mouths don't get fed, right? Like that is the, the, the thing that someone said to me early on in my career that completely changed my life because I was just like, no, they're supposed to know about me. Like, no, put yourself out there. You can also create social media content, but um, I think making sure that it's relevant to the business that you're running, but I'm not a person that's like overly like create all these graphics on social. I think having a conversation, interviewing other people in your, in your field, um, creating that kind of content that is valuable to people is something that I think is one of the greatest marketing tools that you can do. I'm also a fan of using ads, right? And so that's traffic that you are paying for, bringing that to your site, but creating something that is a great kind of lead generator, whether that's a guide, whether that's a webinar, again, that gets them a little acclimated with who you are and what you do, and then get, getting them on your, your, your website. And then also pick up the phone. You know, I think in this digital space that we're in, we also kind of disregard some of the old traditional ways of being able to do things. And so if you have a few leads, right, um, pick up the phone, start having conversations with people. It gives you one, a lot of insight and then have your direct ask ready about how you can add value to them, how you can service them and how they can, how you guys can ultimately work together and how you're solving problems for them. But I say, pick up, pick up the phone. And then I would say the last thing is like, mail is really enchanting right now, guys. Like, yes, the handwritten letter, the thing that we hate doing because an email is just so much easier, but picking up um, having a handwritten letter and kind of sending it to someone, even if you've lost connection with someone, I think a handwritten letter is so enchanting right now that someone getting that in the in the mail, whether it's at their office or if you have their home you know, home address, then sending that to them and saying, hey, I would love to reconnect, or this is what I'm working on right now. Can we schedule a time time to talk? I love getting mail right now more than I ever before. And that is not just the Amazon package, but things that I get make me think and put that person top of mind where I don't get lost in their email box. Yeah, an Amazon package isn't quite as enchanting as a handwritten note. Um, <laughs> I'm happy to get them, but I love that word enchanting. I think that that's it's a perfect word. It would be an experience to get a letter at this right, point. Right, right. Really kind of hear them in a different way. I love that idea. Um, people, the stream is loving your ideas too. I would love some more, some to, to get some creative juices going with them with some of these other, the 65 ideas that you have. Um, and specifically though, we have a few musicians in the stream who are yeah. saying they they haven't been able to find work, wondering if there's any tips for yeah. someone with that creativity, that frame of mind. Ooh, um, musicians, teach classes, please, right? There are, I mean, if, if I was a musician right now, what I would do, right? Um, there's, there's two things that I think you can do. One, um, I would look at like all the podcasts that are in like Spotify, Apple Playlist, any of the podcasts that have really crappy kind of like intro music. And I would shoot them a direct message that you can record that better for them, or you can create like a, a jingle or intro or outro for them. If that's something that you want to do, right? I'm just kind of thinking of like low hanging fruit for you, but that is what I would do. Uh, you could hire someone really cheap off of Fiverr to like catalog all the podcasts in a specific industry in which you want to focus on, find the email addresses for you. You guys got think about opportunity cost, right? And so if it costs you maybe 10 or $15 for someone to create a list of 100 for you, whereas if you were going to do it, you're never going to sit and do it because it just seems like so much work, but someone else can do it cheaper for you, then why not hire that person if that means like dr drastically changing like your bank account? And so that would be one thing. The other thing is because we made this shift of virtual in the education space, right? And I talk a lot about kind of digital divide and what that, that means. Um, summer Virtual summer camps, after school programs, um, parents, individual parents have all been looking for really rich ways to still be able to, rich in experience ways to still be able to occupy their, 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 their child, right? Um, and so, Alicia, you have all this great yeah. advice, and it's it's obvious why people are trying to get a hold of you. Um, thank you so much for sharing with us. I want to ask you another question from Audrey, who wonders, how do you keep yourself motivated as well during all this? You have really great ideas. I think you're helping to make them seem more real for people who might feel intimidated by the idea of starting their own thing. But how do you keep that motivation going once you're over that initial hurdle? 
Yeah, rest, right? And so um, I feel like I've gotten more rest than I've been able to get in the past like four months throughout my entire professional career. And so I'm a big person of like, if the day is getting too crazy for me, I'm going to take a nap, right? Like like my, my six-year-old child will take a nap. The other thing is also, you know, I have a few kind of like motivational mantras that I have like around the house, like look, hustle hard or like, or, or um, work hard and like stay humble that I also are just kind of visually just kind of keep me on track when I'm losing motivation. I also have what I call like your, are you kidding me friends? And I think we're fortunate enough to have like maybe one or two of them, but not a lot of them in our life, but they're the friends that allow you to vent for like maybe all of one or two minutes. And then they remind you who you are, right? Like, oh my God, you've accomplished this. And it's like, why are you doubting yourself in this moment? Imposter syndrome seeks in for a lot of us. And I think even now more than anything with the pandemic happening, I'm seeing a lot more people are suffering from imposter syndrome. This kind of like temporary lapse in judgment of who you are and what you've been able to accomplish. And so having those friends around you that will remind you, but then even if you have to, I call it your, create your epic ish list, right? Um, and putting that down of everything that you've accomplished. And when you have those dark moments or life has punched you in the gut, or you feel like really sluggish and I just don't know how to keep going the next the, the next day, pull that list out as a reminder of like, these are this is how hard I've sacrificed. This is how hard I've worked to get to this point. Um, and why am I questioning myself in, in this moment? And so um, those are some of the things that keep me motivated. I also have a really awesome husband. I got to give him credit. Like he, you know, he listens to the things that go crazy in the business, but then is also someone that motivates me. So Surrounding yourself with really good people. I think this virtual space that we're in as well, you know, while we physically can't be around people that love on us and support us and motivate us, picking up and getting on a Zoom call. And I know a lot of us are tired of Zoom, but anything that you can do to just reconnect with someone, I think is really important, especially when things go rough, right? And we're in rough times. And if you are going to follow your dreams, Life is going to punch you in the gut. That is a given. That is a part of the process. Failure is a part of the process, but you absolutely have to trust the process. But knowing that it happens to other people also gives us a little bit of comfort in realizing that it's not us and to stop individualizing problems, but understand like I'm on this road and I'm going to constantly be tested and constantly be asked, how bad do I want this? And being able to either rest and then get back up and take motivational quotes and get back up, surround yourself with really positive people and get back up are, are really great tools to be able to move forward um, when you're feeling like you're just not feeling yourself. Yeah. And, and I think you should get, are you kidding me on a sign and put that behind you <laughs> for a Zoom call. That's, that's a really good one. Um, Christopher in the stream is saying there's nothing to lose if you don't try, excuse me, nothing to lose unless you try and get that one right. 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 Maya is saying adaptability is key in these unprecedented times. Mm -hmm. She loves your ideas. Audrey says she's loving the conversation. Thank you, Audrey. We're loving having you enjoy it. And she says the possibilities are truly endless in all caps. Um, I, I agree, Felicia, it's been really great to talk with you and hear all these concrete ideas that people can get started. I can tell, I can feel the excitement in the stream that these feel like real things people can go out and start doing now. It's not this nebulous cloud of like, be my own boss, startup. No. Giving us a lot of service speakers. We got stuff to do, right? <laughs> we got stuff to do. You've got stuff to do. Thank you so much for joining us today for the great ideas in the stream. We were loving it. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, guys. That was Felicia Hatcher. She is a social entrepreneur and the co-founder of Black Tech Week, giving you some fabulous ideas to start up a side hustle that you could start right now. If you didn't catch all of Felicia's talk, please rewind this after the broadcast ends and, and get every little nugget of wisdom that she shared because it was really awesome. We were also running a poll throughout the show today. We were wondering if you or someone you know have considered relocating amidst the pandemic. Um, we want to see some of your answers. We see, we see yeses. From Williams, Eli, Sabrina, saying the cost of living and the new opportunity would spur her to think about relocating. Uh, we've got a lot of no answers as well. We, Melissa, Tom, Ashley, Joyce, Larry. Um, Maurice says, no, I love Florida. I know Felicia was in Florida. I think that you guys are neighbors probably. Rebecca says, no need to relocate already. I'm virtual. And we had some other people commenting below. The, the poll's still open on the LinkedIn news page. So if you didn't get a chance to vote here during the broadcast, you can go check it out there. This has been Business Unusual, a show where we are talking about the changing nature of work. Tomorrow at noon Eastern, tune into the LinkedIn news page here for my colleague Andrew Seaman and his show Get Hired Live. Especially if you are a job seeker, you're going to want to check out this great guest.
Jenna Viviano. She's going to be answering all of your questions along with Andrew. It's going to be a great, lively show. I hope to see you then. Thank you for joining me today.